Hello and welcome to IFGIP Live Journal Club for February 2024. My name is Ron Larry. I'm coming to you live today from Mother Pathology, Brisbane, Australia, on the traditional lands of the Jagera and Turrbal people. This month's topic is cervical pathology. Today, I have my fellow moderators with me, Drs. Yang Chen, Sosia Mansur, who are both in Singapore, and Dr. Deborah Smith, who's in Brisbane. So we'll get on to our presentation shortly. Journal Club alternates between the Eastern and Western Hemispheres. The Eastern Hemisphere crew have a new time slot this year. We're now at 10 a.m. Singapore Standard Time on the third Thursday of each month. Now, if you're a keen observer, you will notice today is the fourth Thursday. We've swapped around this month just to make way for the recent updates in gynecological pathology held in both Singapore and Sarawak, which I hear were a tremendous success. So Journal Club tries to cover a fairly comprehensive sweep of articles throughout the year, and there'll be a break in March for USCAP and a break at Christmas as well. Now we're very keen to engage trainee pathologists and junior pathologists from around the world in gynecological pathology. We invite anyone listening today to apply to become a Journal Club presenter. You can contact me or Dr. Natalie Benet for the Western Hemisphere. There's also the interesting case presentation series, which are coordinated by Drs. Pinto and Dr. Zwadi, which give trainees chances to present interesting cases they've been involved with. The objective of the Journal Club is to engage trainees in reading and critically assessing the current literature and to develop their presentation and analytical skills, as you'll see today. We partner each of our presenters with a mentor and they're supported through reading and analysing the article allocated to them and developing a presentation with a standardised framework. Our aim is to make this an enjoyable, educational and well-supported experience for all participants. So the IFTRIP educational site offers a wide range of educational events and resources online. You can watch these live simply by registering with IFTRIP. ISTRIP members also have access to the full archive of slide seminars, lectures, journal clubs and meetings. This great resource is free for trainees who register with ISTRIP and membership is subsidised for pathologists from developing countries. So coming up on the IPSTIP Live platform in the next month, there's a series of interesting case presentations on February 28th. Also, through SoundCloud, you can catch up with the ISTRIP podcast series and the upcoming podcast on February 28th is Dr. Matt Quick talking about the people in pathology perhaps rather than pathology itself. So pathology education, medical student recruitment and junior faculty development. So today's Journal Club, if you're watching live, is in a webinar format. So we encourage you to, to participate as fully as you wish. If you have a question for our presenters, you can submit it via the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom bar. We'll hold all questions to the end when the, the panel of moderators and the presenters will briefly discuss today's papers, and you're welcome to pose any questions you wish. Now, there's also the chat function. So if you just want to say hello and tell us where you are today, or if you've got any other comments or any other experiences you wish to share about some of the topics in today's presentations, you can put that through the chat function as well. And we'll monitor that because sometimes that feedback is really informative about what questions we need to talk about at the end of the presentations. So our presenters today, we have three presenters from Australasia. Our first presenter is Dr. Roshni Verghese. She's at, and I'm going to mispronounce this terribly, so apologies to our Kiwi listeners, Awanui Laboratories, Wellington, New Zealand. Roshni is a fifth year trainee in the RCPH program, and she'll be discussing pattern A endocervical adenocarcinomas with ovarian metastases, a recent paper by Neil et al. Our second Kiwi speaker today will be Dr. Thipa Moran. So Thipa is a second year anatomical pathology trainee at Middlemore Hospital, Auckland, New Zealand. And she'll be talking about tumoral morphological features from cervical biopsies predictive of negligible risk for nodal metastasis, recently published by Wang et al. Our final speaker today will be Dr. Farah El Murray from Westmead Hospital. So Farah is a fifth year trainee in the anatomical pathology program run by the RCPA. Farah's pro presentation will be pre-recorded and we're hoping that she'll be here in time for our discussion. So with that, I will now very quickly hand over to our first speaker, Roshni Bagazi. Roshni, I will stop sharing my screen if you could please pick up the screen. Good afternoon. 
My name is Roshni Verghese, and I'm a pathology registrar at Wellington, New Zealand. The journal article that I will be presenting today is titled Pattern A Endocervical Adenocarcinomas with Ovarian Metastasis are Indolent and Molecularly Distinct from Destructively Invasive Adenocarcinomas. This was published in Histopathology just last month, and it's part of a larger body of work that comes out of Brigham and Women's Hospital in Massachusetts. And the, the lead authors on this uh, journal article are Dr. Carlos Paraheran and Dr. Marissa Nucci. As we all know, the HPV-associated endocervical adenocarcinomas are made up of three distinct patterns. The silver A, which is an indolent and non-destructive type of uh, endocervical adenocarcinoma, and the silver B and C, which are the more aggressive and destructive types, which are associated with lymphovascular invasion and a greater risk of lymph nodal involvement. Now, it was found that these silver A patterns of endocervical adenocarcinomas were found to have rare occurrences of ovarian metastasis. But surprisingly enough, even these patients whose initial presentation included metastasis to the ovary did extraordinarily well on follow-up. And that was the point that the authors of this article wanted to study. Why did these patients with silver A patterns do so well despite the ovarian mets? Is silver A still indolent despite the ovarian mets? Is there a way of demonstrating this point through molecular means? And is there a hypothesis for why these mets to the ovary occur? Of course, such a study is highly relevant. It helps us understand if silver pattern A conforms to a particular set of molecular characteristics that would make them distinct from pattern B and C, thus explaining why these behave so differently. Also, such a study would help us understand the level of risk of ovarian metastasis in patients where fertility sparing is part of the consideration at the time of management planning. So this study was conducted at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. It was a retrospective study with cases taken from 2006 to 2022. The criteria for selection of the cases was one, diagnosis of HPV-associated endocervical adenocarcinoma, two, to have at least one confirmed site of metastasis, and three, sufficient archival material from both the primary cervical resection specimen and the site of metastasis so that all the molecular studies could be performed. Two of the authors looked at the patient's demographics, clinical details, pathological diagnosis to make sure everything was accurate. The analysis that was performed was the targeted next generation sequencing using a 447 gene panel on formalin fixed paraffin embedded material taken from three locations in each patient. One, the primary cervical tumor site. Two, at least one site of tumor metastasis. And three, the adjacent normal somatic tissue. The tissue was analyzed for single nucleotide variants, structural and copy number variants, tumor mutational burden, and molecular signatures. Now, this is a table that's taken from the journal article. And as you can see, 13 patients qualified for this study. In this table, each horizontal line refers to one patient. They were divided based on their silver patterns into two groups. That's group one and group two. Group one was made up of all the patients with silver pattern A, as well as one case of adenocarcinoma in situ. And all of these patients were found to have ovarian mets. Group two was made up of silver pattern uh, B and C, the more aggressive types. The median age of diagnosis was 41. The patients presented at varying FIGO stages and therefore had different types of surgeries according to the stages. And of course, all of the patients were HPV positive. This is another table taken from the same um, article. And again, the alignment is still the same where each horizontal line refers to one patient, four of them falling into group one and nine of them falling into group two. As we can see in this table, uh, 
all of the patients in group one did really well. And once, once again, I stress that the, despite the fact that they had ovarian mets at the time of presentation, all of them had showed no evidence of disease even after at least 31 months of follow-up. You contrast that with group two, which was made up of the more aggressive patterns um, where the patients uh, unfortunately succumbed to the disease, particularly those who had silver pattern uh, C. This is a third table that's taken from the article. Um, once again, the 13 patients have been divided into group one and group two, except in this table, each patient, um, the characteristics are along one vertical column. So these are all the patients with um, silver pattern A in yellow, and these are the ones with uh, pattern B in green, and these are the ones with pattern C in red. There are just a few things I'd like to highlight on this table. It's quite a busy table, but I'd like to highlight a couple of things to you. Um, one is the tumor mutational burden at the primary site. As you can see in the box that I've highlighted out there, the patients with silver pattern C were found to have a higher mutational tumor mutational burden than those of uh, A and B as is the case with the segmental copy number variants, uh, where a higher number was found in C as opposed to pattern A and B. The next thing I'd like to highlight is the PIK3CA mutation. Now this mutation was previously thought to be associated with the more aggressive types of endocervical adenocarcinomas. In other words, the patterns B and C. And this is as per studies that were done by this same group of authors. Now, it, the difference is in this particular journal article that they've put out in this study, they found that the PIK3CA mutations were also present in group one or the silver pattern A, the more indolent type. And the last point I'd like to point out um, on with regards to this table is the ERBB2 mutation amplification. Now, this is not a mutation that is otherwise normally associated with um, endocervical adenocarcinomas. It's more associated with um, tumors and other organs. But they found that in a subset of their patient population, um, that this amplification was found. And this was in keeping with a recent study put out by another group. I'll be coming to the uh, points around that in a bit. Now, coming to the results uh, the of the molecular findings, the first um, discussion that uh, the authors put out was about the around the acquisition of mutations. The study was able to demonstrate that in group two, which was made up of pattern B and C, when comparing the genomics of the tumor at the primary site with that of the met metastatic site, it was found that the majority of tumors had acquired novel mutations by the time they reached the site of metastasis. On the other hand, in silver pattern A, the majority of cases showed no such evolution of the mutations in the ovarian mets. In fact, the metastatic site at the ovaries bore a strong genomic res resemblance to the primary site in the cervix. The next result was centered around driver mutations. A tumor at its primary site develops driver mutations in its attempt to evolve and spread. And when a tumor spreads to a distant metastatic site, one would expect to see the driver mutations even within the tumors at the metastatic site. But if the breakaway of the tumor deposits happens early enough, the metastatic site will not have the same driver mutations as the primary site. And this is what was found in this study that in the setting of endocervical adenocarcinomas with METs to the ovary, the MET did not have the same driver mutations as the primary site. And this indicates that the tumor had the ability to spread to the ovary very early in its evolutionary journey. And it's these key findings that led the authors to hypothesize that in fact, the endocervical adenocarcinomas have the ability to break away and travel through the preformed pathway or the lumen of the endometrial cavity through the lumen of the fallopian tube to reach the ovaries. So in fact, when this happens in silver A, endocervical adenocarcinomas, it's not actually the aggressiveness of the tumor that results in ovarian mets, but in fact, 
a passive transfer of tumor through what is essentially a preformed passage. And this transmolarian spread explains why the tumor continues to behave in an indolent manner, despite apparently having ovarian mets. And in fact, even morphologically, the metastatic tumor at the ovaries had a bland and well-differentiated adenofibromatous appearance in silver pattern A. On the other hand, the silver patterns B and C, with their destructive nature, stromal response, lymphovascular invasion, were thought to reach the metastatic sites through vascular channels by virtue of their aggressive behavior, and then continue to create havoc, resulting in the known poor outcome for these patients. The last two points regarding the molecular findings are things that I touched on uh, on the previous slide. The fact that there was a higher frequency of PIK3CA mutations in pattern A that was previously thought to be associated with the more aggressive patterns B and C. The authors hypothesized that an aberrant PIK3CA mutation in pattern A endocervical adenocarcinomas may indicate that a patient is at risk of transmolarian spread to the ovary. The next point was around ERBB2 amplifications. Uh, since these mutations were identified in the study, the authors suggested that we highlight the value in um, evaluating this mutation in further studies. Uh, as far as the clinical and histopathological results went, the patients with pattern A did well in this study, as we saw, despite ovarian metastatic disease. And regarding involvement of endometrium and fallopian tubes, when the patients with endocervical adenocarcinomas were noted to have ovarian mets, they were also found to have tumors sitting in the superficial luminal layers of the endometrium and fallopian tube as well, which supported this um, transmolarian um, spread of, um, of tumor through the endometrial cavity. It supported their hypothesis on that. There are, of course, clinical applications to a study like this. In patients with endocervical adenocarcinoma with silver A patterns who do not have known metastasis, a conservative fertility sparing approach to management could be considered. That was one suggestion from the study. The next was that um, there are certain circumstances in which ovarian mets can be suspected. For instance, in a patient where an ovary sorry, in a, where an ovary sparing hysterectomy is performed for endocervical adenocarcinoma, if the uterine corpus and the fallopian tube is noted on histology to have metastatic deposits, there is a high possibility that the deposits have reached the ovary as well, and therefore increased surveillance of ovaries over time would be warranted in such situations. However, this would involve us taking several more blocks of the endometrium and fallopian tube at the cut-up bench to look for involvement, which would be a change of practice from the representative sections that most of us normally uh, would put through at this point. The other point around when to suspect ovarian mets is related to if molecular testing or sequencing is performed on the original cervical biopsy specimens in pattern A, and if a PIK3CA mutation is found, this raises the possibility of ovarian spread. And this would, of course, be a more expensive venture, but it would open doors to PIK3CA targeted chemotherapies for these particular patients. As far as the strengths of this article go, it was a very interesting read, and the journal article was very easy to read. Even though there were uh, complex molecular considerations, it was put across in a very easy way. Um, this, like I said, is part of a larger body of work um, around endocervical adenocarcinomas. And articles like this help encourage a conversation amongst um, academic spheres around the future in management of HPV-associated endocervical adenocarcinomas with emphasis on a pattern-based approach. And this, of course, would have clinical utility. Um, as far as the limitations of the study go, this was a small study with just 13 patients, but this is not entirely unexpected given the strict inclusion criteria for the cases. However, if in the future a multi-center study was to be performed, 
of course, a, mus a much bigger sample size could be achieved. This was a retrospective study with clinical information and follow-up um, being uh, not being uniform for all patients. Uh, they had a limited genomic panel that they worked with. Another um, topic of another point of consideration really is the fact that in the article they do not mention where the deposits were in the ovary, whether they were limited to the surface or whether they were within the stroma of the ovary. Because if they were limited to the surface, that would lend credibility to the hypothesis that it was that these um, tumor deposits were traveling through the cavity of the endometrium to deposit on the ovary. And finally, there was no standardization for how the HPV testing was done with some of them having molecular testing and others just having P16 done. However, P16 is an internationally accepted standard for, um, immunohist uh, for testing for HPV in the cervix. In, su um, in summary, uh, the article states that um, pattern A HPV associated endocervical adenocarcinoma is indolent, even in the setting of ovarian metastasis. Ovarian metastasis in pattern A uh, potentially spreads through the endometrial cavity at a very early stage. And these concepts can be used as the basis for a more tailored management approach for pattern A HPV associated endocervical adenocarcinoma in the future. These are the references um, that I looked up um, during the course of my reading of this article. And these first two references are written by the same authors and they help provide a little more support to this particular journal article and help make it a um, much easier read. The other references are our usual um, uh, references that we look at for our synoptic reports in uh, pathology. I'd like to thank Dr. Rowan Lowry and Dr. Diane Kenwright for their um, help with this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Roshni. That was wonderful. If I could ask you to stop sharing your screen and Thipa, if you would like to share your screen and go ahead with your presentation, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Deepa and I'm a second year anatomical pathology registrar from Auckland, New Zealand. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present to all of you today. The journal article that I will be presenting is titled Tumoral Morphological Features from Cervical Biopsies that are Predictive of a Negligible Risk for Nodal Metastasis and Tumor Recurrence in Usual Type um, Cervical Adenocarcinoma. Um, it's a multi-institutional study published in 2022 in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology. Endocervical adenocarcinoma is the second most common malignancy of the cervix, and about 20% of these cancers are diagnosed in young adults, a population in which the disease and management affects fertility and family planning. And approximately 10 to 15% of patients with HPV-associated endocervical adenocarcinoma develop nodal metastasis or tumor recurrence. Um, currently, the prognostic factors include um, tumor stage and pattern-based classification system, or the silver pattern. However, it is difficult to apply those in biopsies. And hence, this study was carried out to investigate the reliability of histological features in biopsies in predicting these two outcomes. Um, this is a retrospective study where cases diagnosed between 2001 to 2020 were collected from 18 institutions in the US and China, and they were assessed by pathologists. Inclusion criteria included diagnosis of HPV-associated endocervical adenocarcinoma, slides availability for both biopsy and resection specimen for each case, and regional lymph node assessment. HPV-independent cancers, secondary carcinomas, and cases where the primary site was unclear were excluded. The final studied cohort included 397 patients with total 794 specimens. For each patient, um, the following histological and clinical details were collected from the biopsy and resection specimen. And for the purpose of this presentation, I will focus on findings related to 
tumor nuclear grade and necrotic tumor debris, which were also the focus of the study. And I'll briefly discuss the nodal status assessment as well. The study utilized um, tumor nuclear grade that was recently described in a smaller study by Rivera Colon, um, evaluating histological features of endocervical biopsies to predict tumor behavior. It is assessed um, on a three-tiered scale of increasing abnormalities from low to high grade. Uniform elongate hyperchromatic nuclei without chromatin clearing or nucleoli were classified as grade one. And grade three nuclear features include large pleomorphic nucleus with vesicular nuclei and prominent nucleoli. Grade two was assigned to cases that showed areas of grade three nuclei in less than 50% of the tumor. Necrotic tumor debris was defined by the presence of necrotic and ap apoptotic tumor cells within the tumor glandular lumens it mixed with um, granular isnophilic material and inflammatory cells. Um, frank tumor necrosis, ischemic changes, and inflammatory debris in glands were excluded. This study included cases with pelvic and or periaortic lymph node assessment. Positive lymph node was defined by, um, it was de defined as tumor deposits greater than two millimeter in size. Micrometastasis as well as isolated tumor cells were recorded, but not calculative, calculated as positive nodes in the study. And at least two levels of negative nodal sections were histologically examined. A few methods were used for statistical analysis. The Fisher exact test was used for binary outcomes such as nodal mets and tumor recurrence. The Cochrane Armitage trend test was used for outcomes that had more than two audit levels such as um, stage and tumor size. And the multivariate logistic regression analysis was conducted to and an association between nuclear grade and necrotic tumor debris and the outcomes adjusting for other variables, tumor size and FIGO stage. And the Kaplan-Meier curves were plotted to present the probability of recurrence-free survival. Next, moving to the um, results of the study and starting with demographics. The table on the left is a summary of clinical demographics of patients in the study derived from the article. There were some discrepancies between the information provided in the body of the article and the table. Um, and I've highlighted here in this table, there is a minor difference to the age range. However, the average age remains as 47 years. Um, the HPV status is described as high risk versus absence of high risk types in the body of the article. Whereas in the table, HPV status is referred to as positive and negative. And based on the table, it appears that the HPV negative and unknown cases were also included in the study. Bearing in mind, HPV independent cancers is an exclusion criteria highlighted earlier. Majority of the patients had um, FIGO stage one disease and um, only 392 nodal sections were specimens were evaluated and there were no further explanations given for the five cases without lymph nodes. Next is the results of the biopsy um, nuclear grade. This is, the, this is a table from the article summarizing the relationship between nuclear grade and other clinical pathological features that were assessed. The majority of the tumors were grade two, about 56%, uh, while 20% were grade one and grade three. The results from this table shows um, that grade one tumors compared to grade two and three tumors were less likely to be associated with nodal metastasis, tumor recurrence, LVI, larger tumor size, and a high FIGO stage. No statistically significant difference was found with regard to depth of invasion between the three groups. And after adjusting for the other variables, Biopsy nuclear grade one was found to be associated with lower rates of nodal mets and lower rates of tumor recurrence. Next, um, necrotic tumor debris. This table summarizes the relationship between necrotic tumor debris and the other clinical pathologic features. 
Necrotic tumor debris, or NTD, was identified in 44% of biopsies. And as outlined in this table, NTD negative tumors were less likely to be associated with nodal metastasis, LVI, and were more likely to have a smaller tumor size on resection. And again, after adjusting for depth of invasion, LVI, tumor size, FIGO stage, and silver pattern, the NTD negative tumors were associated with lower rates of nodal metastasis and tumor recurrence. Among the NTD negative patients, 11 of them had positive nodal status and tumor recurrence, and a detailed review was carried out, and they were found to have either nuclear grade two or three in the resection specimen, and seven of these patients had necrotic tumor debris in the resection specimen. The authors then concluded that concluded from this finding that necrotic tumor debris alone did not adequately describe the severity of disease in the biopsies. They then identified a total of 73 biopsies showing low-risk histological features, which is defined in this paper as combination of nuclear grade one and um, absence of NTD. None of these cases had nodal metastasis and one patient had tumor recurrence. This patient was found to have nuclear grade three and um, necrotic tumor debris on the resection specimen. And in contrast, among the 324 biopsies with high nuclear grade and necrotic tumor debris, 19% had um, nodal metastasis and 12% had tumor recurrence. In summary, they propose that these two variables in combination could be utilized to identify a subset of patients with low nodal metastatic and tumor recurrence rate. There are a few points that I would like to discuss in regards to the results and findings of the study. Firstly, although this study showed statistically significant results, there was significant discordance between the biopsies and resection. The overall concordance rate for nuclear grade is 78% with weighted kappa of 0 0.6492, and the overall concordance for um, necrotic tumor debris is about 79%. Um, so both has weighted kappa values that only shows moderate reliability of the results and about 17% error rate. The concordance of the combination um, TNG1 and NTD negative tumors also had a low concordance rate of 63%. Um, and the results of the study are not adjusted for this, this, this discordance rate. The authors do acknowledge that this is a limitation of the study and that in a number of cases, the biopsy alone will not capture the worst histological features. They propose that clinicians could consider performing a more localized surgery before radical surgery. And if these low risk histological features remain consistent uh, between the biopsy and resection, the patients could be considered for a more conservative management. And this is probably something that could be explored in future studies. The second point for discussion is the nodal status assessment. Micrometastasis um, is included as positive finding in both the AJCC and FIGO staging system. However, this has been excluded in the study. This could have underestimated the rate of nodal positivity and should be taken into account when interpreting the results. Additional levels for negative nodes were also assessed, and this may not be the practice in other institutions. Um, next, there were a lot of errors and discrepancies that were identified throughout the article. For example, the HPV status mentioned earlier may cause confusion for the readers. The title of the article also emphasizes that this study is focused on um, usual type endocervical adenocarcinoma. However, other types were also included, um, including the high-risk types, uh, which could potentially skew the um, outcome data. There were errors in the numbers and uh, information provided in the body of the article, and there were also errors identified in the Kaplan-Meier curve. The Kaplan-Meier curve is used to plot the recurrence-free survival or time until tumor recurrence, and this graph is meant to show that patients with lower nuclear grade, or NTD negative, have higher chances of survival over time 
compared to um, nuclear grade two or three. However, there were some errors that were identified. Firstly, in the y-axis where it says percent recurrence, it should be percentage recurrence free. And in the x-axis, um, it, it is given in days and it should have been converted to months or years for practical purposes. And thirdly, there is no there is no numbers at risk at the bottom, and this is important to understand the amount of data contributing to parts of the curve. Um, the recurrence-free survival also doesn't include deaths, and it should should have been analyzed as competing risk. The strengths of this study include large study size and its multi-institutional nature, which increases the general applicability of the findings. The follow-up duration is um, long with a median follow-up of 2.9 years, and these ensures that any delayed recurrence of cervical cancers are also detected. It was also mentioned in the paper that a consensus meeting was held to discuss the features of nuclear grade and tumor necrotic debris to reduce inter-observer variability. Few areas for improvement. Um, the institute specific differences in surgical and non surgical treatments were not addressed in the analysis. Future studies should also incorporate adjustments to concordance or discordance rate when interpreting the results. There were also a lot of discrepancies or errors throughout the article that could make one question the credibility of this paper. Um, and this could be likely due to the complex nature of this study, where multiple variables were studied at the same time and hence making it more vulnerable for errors to occur. Although this study presents um, statistically significant results of nuclear grade one and um, necrotic tumor debris negative biopsies in predicting low risk nodal metastasis and tumor recurrence, it is only applicable to a small subset of patients. And given its rel relatively high discordance rate, um, it is still early for clinical application. I think the findings of this study um, could potentially be a discussion point with the clinical team and for consideration of further uh, future prospective studies. And that's all from me. And I would like to thank Dr. Deborah Smith for helping me throughout this um, presentation or pre preparing for this presentation and also um, our statisticians who helped to provide input regarding the um, statistical analysis. And the following are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Thipa, for a great presentation and what's obviously a very close and critical reading of that article. That's much appreciated. We're now going to move on to Farah's recorded presentation. So in one moment, I will share my screen and share the audio. And I will rely on my co-moderators to make sure that the audio is working as well. Hi, my name is Farah. I'm one of the pathology trainees in Westmead Hospital in Sydney, Australia. Australia. Today I'm presenting an article that's been published in Archives of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine in March 2023, a study done by Dr. Natalie Bennett and her group entitled Comparison of a Human Papilloma Virus RNA in Situ Hybridization and P16 Immunostaining in Diagnostically Challenging High-Grade Sequemas in Trichothelial Lesion in the Background of Atrophy. Human papilloma virus in the postmenopausal age group is considered to be a complex disease with increased risk of progression into invasive disease as 20% of invasive SCC of the cervix occurs in patients older than 65 years of age. This could be due to decreased clearance of the virus or difficult visualization of the transformation zone during colposcopic examination, adding to that lack of vaccination in this population. So the American Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology recommends continued screening for cervical cancer in patients older than 65 years of age who have a history of prior abnormalities. Also, it is found that the risk of development of subsequent H cell is highest in postmenopausal patients who have both abnormal cervical cytology and positive HPV testing. Some studies have suggested an increasing specificity of testing for HPV with increased age. As we know, atrophic changes of the cervix can make 
histologic distinction from the edge cell sometimes difficult and the cervical epithelium with edge cell in photos C and D demonstrate lack of maturation of the sequimal cells with parabasal like appearance the chromatin is coarse mitotic activity elevated um, we love see it in full thickness distribution while the above row which is photos a and b show cervical atrophy with again lack of maturation and predominance of parabasal like cells but no uh, nuclear changes and no elevation in mitotic activity this is even more difficult in small samples or those with crush artifact or tangential section Adding to that, the presence of inflammation may further complicate the interpretation. So the objective of the study is to compare and determine morphologic and ancillary testing characteristic of atrophy and cell in postmenopausal patients. And because the use of ancillary testing can clarify this differential diagnosis, so they set a selection criteria where they collected 81 uh, patients uh, encompassing 109 specimens and that because some patient had more than one specimen under the same category or different categories and all of them were older than 65 years of age and the results were divided into benign and edge cell diagnosis and these edge cell categories were further subdivided was the diagnosis done on a small biopsy or was it done on excision and the excision includes leap specimens con excision or even hysterectomies available clinical information including hpv status and follow-up was also collected when available co-testing for hpv was also performed and that was divided into hpv high risk 1618 or hpv others sufficient, sufficient tissue was available to do ki67 uh, by ihc on 107 cases p16 by ihc on 106 cases and hpv ish uh, or in situ hybridization was done on 95 cases they also set morphologic or, or parameters including morphologic characteristics and they were looking for a presence or absence of any atrophy uh, what are the nuclear chromatin characteristics any associated inflammatory cells and presence or absence of mitotic figures and if it was present where it is a present is it in the lower or middle or upper third of the epithelium when the sequimus epithelium was oriented immunostains as we mentioned were done and the p16 labeling was divided into negative patchy or diffuse ki67 scores were noted on five scales with percentage representation distance from basement membrane and the results were divided from zero where it is negative with no elevation of ki67 up to score four when there is an uh, full thickness elevation of ki67 again when it was oriented fragments inside to hybridization score was divided either as negative or positive and the positivity was considered when it was strong brown dot like nuclear and or cytoplasmic staining or considered positive moving to the results the pre-biopsy hpv status was known in 51 percent of cases 80 percent of of those patients were hpv positive however 61 percent of those 80 percent were under hpv others while only 39 showed hpv high risk positivity both hpv positive groups were highest in the h cell biopsy category and for those who had hpv high risk hpv 16 was more common than hpv 18. for the cervical cytology results they were available in 63% of cases, 73% uh, in whom showed sequimus abnormalities, and of those, 22% were under atypical sequimus, cannot rule out H cell, while 29% showed negative cervical cytology results. Atrophy was found in 88% of cases and the coarse nuclear chromatin was noted in none of the benign cases, 63% of H cell biopsies and 94% of H cell excision. This, this finding was statistically significant between the benign and H cell category uh, 
groups. Mitotic figures were not noted in the benign cases, while in the H cell biopsy cases, 47% had no mitotic figures, whereas the remaining cases had, and they were evenly distributed across the lower, middle, and upper third in the cases with oriented epithelium. In the H cell excisional specimens, more cases showed mitotic figures with higher percentage noted in the middle to upper third, both of 27%, and when comparing the benign and the cell biopsy cases, mitotic activity was statistically significant. Inflammation was present in 84% of all cases. For the cell biopsy cases, 93% of those biopsies showed ele ele elevation in inflammatory infiltrate, and most of these inflammatory cells were chronic inflammatory lymphocytic cell infiltrate. KI67 proliferation index in the benign cases showed a proliferation staining that was confined to the lower portion in 72%, whereas the converse was true of the H cell cases, with the biopsy and excision cases having full thickness elevation in 72 and 96%, respectively. P16 findings in the benign group, all cases were negative for P16. Eight cases of H cell were negative for P16, which is uh, uh, eight out of 53, 15%. And that was divided into four cases in the H cell biopsy, or 15%, and four cases in the H cell ca category, excision category, again, equal to 15%. For the HPV RNA ish findings, all of the benign cases were negative for HPV ish. Uh, in the H cell category, benign, uh, biopsy cases all were positive, while excision only one case was negative for ish. Of the eight cases of ish P16 discordant results, seven cases were P16 negative, ish positive, whereas one case was P16 positive and ish negative. Six out of those seven cases showed positive results on concurrent or subsequent specimens. The single case with positive P16 staining and ish negativity showed full thickness elevation of KI67 proliferation index. Sorry. Moving to the discussion, 80% in whom HPV status was known were HPV positive. In those, the majority were HPV others and the minority were HPV high risk. And that was discordance with other studies. Also, it is noted in other studies that HPV high risk occur in majority of invasive SCC of the cervix in approximately 41% in one of the studies. And this discrepancy could be due to sampling differences or the difference in HPV subtypes between H cell and invasive cancers. For the cervical cytology, 31% with tissue diagnosis of H cell had pre-biopsy cervical cytology with diagnosis of negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy or atypical sequoma cells of undetermined significance. Though the cervical cytology test has shown decreased sensitivity in older patients, especially in the atypical sequoma cells of undetermined significance group, and these specimens still warrant careful evaluation. For the mitotic activity, as we noticed, it was absent or lone benign cases, and absent or lone approximately half of the H cell cases. This suggests that mitotic figures are decreased not only in the atrophic cervical epithelium, but also in some dysplastic lesion arising in atrophic epithelium. Interestingly, one of the studies was done on patients with H cell on progestin, which is uh, another cause for hypoestrogenic state. They found there was a reduction in the mitotic activity in the upper layer of the epithelium. Additionally, the morphology finding of course nuclear chromatin and any elevation of mitotic activity were found to be statistically significant between the benign and H cell biopsy categories. And these findings are widely applicable in clinical practice. For 
P16 IHC, as we mentioned, 15% were P16 negative, and at the first glance, this number does appear somewhat high compared with the prior studies, in which P16 has been shown to be highly correlated with HSL, but this is not true when we uh, combine SIN2 and SIN3 morphology together, as uh, these show uh, HPV uh, others rather than HPV high risk and SIN2 morphology and this show that SIN2 is a heterogeneous cohort and diagnosis is poorly reproducible though reproducibility is increased with the use of P16 but even though the predominance of SIN2 morphology is not the only factor that may account for the lack of P16 staining in this study. But the presence of extensive cautery artifact and sampling effect may also account for the lack of P16 staining. Only one case that was negative for P16 had unequivocal SIN3 morphology in this study. KI67 proliferative index is frequently used in conjunction with P16 for the diagnosis of HSL, and it was found that it was consistently low in benign cases and consistently high uh, in the upper middle and uh, upper third of the epithelium of HSL cases. Both results were in keeping with previously described report. Even with the presence of cautery artifact, which was present in many cases, this didn't affect the expression of KI67, make it a powerful adjunct for the diagnosis of HSL in older patients. However, caution must be advised to interpret only sequamous cells on KI67 stain and subtract all the associated inflammatory lymphocytic cell infiltrate. To specifically address the eight cases that showed discrepant findings between P16 expression and ISH, the first and most common scenario, which is seven out of eight cases, were P16 negative and ISH positive. As we see in photos A to D, uh, the majority were uh, SIN2 morphology or HSL with focal maturation. KI67 was elevated, though somewhat difficult to analyze because of tangential sectioning in photo B. Uh, P16 was non diffuse or considered to be negative in photo C, and HPV ish was positive in D. While the lower four photos from E to H, which is an exigenal specimen, better orientation, full thickness, loss of maturation, and coarse nuclear chromatin, there is full elevation of Ki67 in photo F, while uh, P16 was negative in G and H show positive HPV staining. And the single case that was P16 positive and ish negative, it showed a uh, H cell morphology with uh, involvement of the endocervical gland with streaming of oil cells, coarse chromatin, lack of maturation. Uh, photo B showed KI67 elevation with diffusely positive P16 in photo C and HPV ish was negative, and that could be because of lack of specific HPV type in the ish test. So the strength or A for improvement in this study is the RNA ish testing. It is an emerging in a clinical use, but unfortunately not widely available in many laboratories where cost may play a role in implementing this test. However, this study has shown strong correlation with P16 labeling, which is available in many settings. Additionally, RNA ish can be requested via reference testing in selected cases that fall into the parameter of this study. So in summary, postmenopausal patient with HSL can pose diagnostic difficulties with morphologic changes can be limited, uh, especially on smaller biopsies, mitotic activity not reliably elevated, even though KI67 was consistently high, but in the presence of morphologic changes consistent with HSL, ish should be considered in cases where morphology and immune labeling show discordance or when specimen quality and quantity proves challenging. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, um, Farah. They were really excellent talks, all of you. So Roshni, Thipa and Farah, well done for that.
Um, we are actually running towards the end of our time, our official time, but we did start late and we're just starting to get to questions now. So I think we'll just let it drift a little bit later than we usually run. Um, and attendees, you're welcome to stay with us for that. We do have one um, question for Roshni about your talk from the audience, and that is, if pick 3 a mutations are not found in primary tumours, that will not be of help, is it? Because only positive results are informative. Roshni, do you want to speak to that? You can also ask for help as well. Yeah. Uh, this um, it this does feel like a question that an oncologist would be able to answer better than me. Um, so I'd look back at the article when I saw this question, and I did note that the authors did not mention if the pic 3 ca mutations that they found were in the METS or the primary. In fact, they just said METS or primary between brackets. Um, now, when I'm thinking this through, and this is just me thinking off the top of my head, if a mutation is not found Sorry, in Roshni, the primary... Do you, just, do you just flick your video on? Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, if a mutation is not found in the primary, but it is found in the MET, that would be an acquired mutation or an acquisition of mutations. And then the question that's put forward is, is that of any benefit? Um, if we're looking at these mutations that have been acquired and we're looking at targeting them from a chemotherapy point of view, um, I'm, I'm not too sure if if a mutation that's there in the met but not in the primary is there still benefit for the patient from you know um, giving them chemotherapy that would only take care of the met and not the primary um, I feel I can't answer that I feel like an oncologist would be able to answer that question better um, I, I is think, there anybody um, who'd like to chip in <laughs> I think Roshni and I discussed this a bit during the paper as well, and it actually refers back to the other reading that, that Roshni had done by members of the same group looking at the mutational profile in endocervical adenocarcinomas. And that this was a different cohort of specimens, and they didn't find any pic 3 a mutations. Um, and But then in this other little cohort where they've tracked down METs, they found three out of four of them did have mutations. So the other question is, is this some kind of marker of risk? Now, I think as Roshni explained that these, this is a really small study. It's a really interesting conversation starter. No one's going to act on that right now. But it does make you wonder, is, is that a marker of risk if you've got a silver pattern A adenocarcinoma that does have a pic C3? mutation, should you really seriously be thinking about what's going on in the ovaries? And thank you to the audience member for the question. Can I just so, ask the rest of you to turn your videos on as well, so we can just rotate around conversation? Yeah. So um, I just wanted to ask Farah, um, th thank you for your for your discussion. It was great. Uh, you made the point that RNA-ish is a little bit difficult to find. I, I just wondered, have you had any experience of it and any experience in interpreting it? Um, not personal. I haven't uh, reported an RNA-ish, but it's been running in my department. Um, and I think uh, there is no issue in in doing that, uh, many of our pathologists can request this um, RNA-ish testing that's been done, but um, not personal experience. Actually, I really like that article because I, I find um, H1 atrophy quite difficult, actually in the vagina as well. Um, so that was a really useful breakdown of how to approach it. Um, do you tend to get a KI-67 routinely with your cervical biopsies? Oh, yes, we do. Not routinely, but in the difficult cases, yes. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. And can I ask a question of um, Deepa? And this is related to our study where we did wander around in the statistics a little bit, because there was mm -hmm. a lot of them. Um, and I think, you know, we, we talked about how there are competing studies out there that may or may not um, show the same thing. So there is research to come. But how how did doing going through this process of reading this deeply change or how has that got affected the way you look at studies in general? 
you know, I, I have a tendency to sometimes want to just pick them up and run with them. Yeah. So I think initially when I first looked at the paper, I just looked at the beginning bit, looked at the conclusions in the discussion. I was like, oh, they have statistically significant results. This is a good paper with a big sample size. But I think only after looking at it carefully, when you dissect through the cases like one by one, and you notice how complex it is and how difficult it is to understand the the statistics and connecting the statistics with the results and what they are saying about the results. And it didn't really make any sense to me. Um, and then we had the discussion with you. And then I think the statisticians um, help in trying to um, help us with um, with the Kaplan-Meier curve. I think that really brought, brought it out that, you know, there were a few errors. And it really, really made me realize the importance of statistics knowledge, um, you know, in when we are reading uh, research articles, how important it is. And also the involvement of statisticians in research. I think they should be actively involved in research and making sure that the um, the results being published are, you know, of relevant and of less errors. Thank you. And I've just realized we've got some more audience questions. Rowan, do you want to kick off there? Okay, so this is a question for um, this is a question for Farah. Um, a, a question from the audience, which is actually a very interesting question. Is there a cutoff for ish to call it positive? Like, and so our questioner uses the example that for ER and ER in the breast, the cutoff is one percent. So when what do you do with low-level positivity? When do you call it negative? When do you call it positive? A really interesting and difficult question. Yeah, actually, the the article didn't mention a cutoff point. They just mentioned positive, and if when the positivity is strong and diffuse, whether it is um, cytoplasmic or nuclear, that was the cutoff. So I think uh, my interpretation was any weak expression is not considered to be positive um that's my expression so it needs to be strong and diffuse positivity thank you so as um dr smith mentioned um we have run over our allocated time so it's probably Sorry, a good Robin, time there's still, to... a, there's still a question above the paper still... can we get yeah oh my great presentations goodness. Thank you. For Thipa, the depth of invasion was not related to the risk of metastasis or to the nuclear grade, question mark. Thipa, can you see the question as well? Yes, yeah. Um, so just looking at the paper again now, so they have definitely said there's no statistical, statistically significant difference in regards to depth of invasion and the nuclear grade. Um, but... They haven't mentioned anything about the depth of invasion and the necrotic tumor debris. And I think they have also found, um, they, they have given um, information on the depth of invasion. Um, and they have said that the deeper depth of invasion is significantly related with increased risk of tumor recurrence and nodal mass, as per the paper. Yeah. Sorry, does that answer the question? Yeah, so it is related to the um, nodal meds and tumor recurrence and no statistical significance with the um, different grades of the tumor. Okay, thank you. So if that's our final question, we might sign off for today. So I'll just thank our three speakers for three great and quite enlightening and very critical presentations. So thank you, Roshni. Thank you, Deepa. Thank you, Farah. I'll thank my co-moderators, Dr. Deborah Smith, Dr. Cecilia Mansour, Dr. Yao Yun Ching. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you to our audience for joining us. The next journal club will not be in March, but instead is in April. There, were, there was a break in March for USCAP, and the next Journal Club in April will be the Western Hemisphere, headed by Dr. Natalie Benet, Dr. Ian Hagman, and Dr. Becca Wolski. Topic, next, topic for that month is endometrium. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.